uh, lecture series, about 60 lessons on the Noahide laws, our mitzvot, and the lifestyle course that goes along with it. Uh, today, we're going to start the first of several lessons that are going to be talking about the festivals and how the Ben or Bat Noach should include themselves in those festivals. What is the um, ramifications of the nations versus Israel in each one of these? We're going to take our time and we're going to first break down sort of do of introduction to the festivals and then we'll ease into Rosh Hashanah for a bit and then we'll cover in the next the full essence of Rosh Hashanah. The discussion that we would like to have is very important is to talk about Torah time. What is Torah time? Well, it appears that the high holy days of Judaism is like the numbers on a clock. One, two, three, four, five, each number representing a different time of the day. And in the Jewish calendar, each one of the high holy days is uh, another place on the timepiece of Hashem and heaven. This is why the feast and the festivals are very important in Torah Judaism. The Torah established a spiritual calendar for the world. However, this calendar does not represent a single conception of time. Instead, the spiritual calendar is a complex affair of concentric interlocking cycles. Let me give you an example. The Mishnah, Rosh Hashanah, tells us that there are several Rosh Hashanahs or several New Years, each demarking a unique cycle of time. These cycles run concurrently, overlaying each other, creating an ever-shifting mosaic of seasons. The four Rosh Hashanahs, or the four New Years, this might be a bit complicated at first. Take time, write some notes, use your highlighter, and then go back and find a Hebrew calendar and look and see how these dates work. The first of Nisan, this is a Jewish month, the first of Nisan, is the new year for kings and festivals. The 15th of Elul is the new year for tithing of animals, according to Rabbi Eliezer and Shimon. This is on the first of Tishri, and the first of Tishri for the counting of years. The Jubilee and Shemitah cycles and the tithing of trees and produce. The first of Shavat is the new year for trees, according to the Shiva school of Shemai and the school of Hillel. It is, according to Hillel, it's on the 15th of Shavat and not the first. This flow of spiritual time is demarked by a number of holy days that, that give shape and meaning for each one of these events. For most of these holidays, their significance exists on two levels. One level is a universal and important to all peoples. The other level is very narrow and applicable only to the Israelites or the Jewish people. For example, Let's look at the holiday of Sukkot. For Israel, it commemorates God's providence and guardianship of Israel via the Hakavod, clouds of glory which surrounded Israel as they traveled in the desert. The festival of huts built on the holiday are in commemoration of these clouds. We see the mitzvah of building a Sukkot is of very unique significance to Israel. This is true of many of the Torah commandments pertaining to Sukkot. However, Sukkot is also the holiday on which the world is judged for water. This point is of universal significance. Water is the lifeblood of the world, and it is fundamental to the survival of every living thing on the planet. The amount of rain and its geographic distribution is determined on the holiday of Sukkot. Some may be judged uh, with drought, others for floods, whatever we pray that each nation and each person will receive just the right amount of water. Additionally, offerings are given on Sukkot to atone for the nations of the world, very significant for the pious non-Jew. 
While the Jews have Yom Kippur, the other nations of the world have Sukkot. Very important for Noahides to know. For Noahides, these aspects of Sukkot are the most relevant. They transcend the specific observances of Israel's common concerns for all of humanity and the world. As we embark on our study of the Taurus holidays, our goal is to identify which holiday have universal significance, now, the nature of that significance, and how that significance may be uh, positively expressed by the Noahides in the world. Let's look at a starting point. A good starting point is found in Mishnah Rosh Hashanah, uh, chapter 1, uh, section 2. At four junctures, the world is judged on Passover for grain, on Shavuot for fruit, on Rosh Hashanah, all pass before him like sheep of a flock. As it is written, he formed their hearts as one. He understands all of their deeds, Psalm 33. On Sukkot, the world is judged for water, which is really an interesting thing. The Mishnah teaches us which of the Torah holidays hold universal significance and are important for the entire world. It also tells us the main theme of these holidays. On Passover, God decides on the volume or distribution of the world's grain produce. I don't think that most even realize that. While the liberation from Egypt, observance of the Passover sacrifices, the Seder, etc., are uniquely of Jewish concern. The concern for worldwide food resources is universal for sure. And for Noahides, this is a central concern of Passover holiday, of God providing the food for us for the rest of the year. On Shavuot, uh, for fruits on the Shavuot, the world is judged as to whether the fruit trees will yield enough produce to sustain the world's population. Shavuot is also a commemoration of the giving of Torah, Metan Torah. For Noahides, the giving of the Torah holds a very special significance because it was then that the Noahide laws were reaffirmed by Moses on Shavuot. The original Noahide covenant was placed under the umbrella of the covenant of Sinai. For the Noahides, these are the two central themes of Shavuot, reaffirmation of the Noahide laws and the judgment on the produce of the trees. On Rosh Hashanah, all passes before him like sheep of the flock. We say pass before God, pass before Mashiach. All people of the world will be judged according to their deeds on Rosh Hashanah. This includes Noahides as well, as Jews. While the blowing of the shofar is unique to the Jews, the general idea of repentance and judgment is important to all. And as we shall see, many of the customs of Rosh Hashanah, meaning non-mitzvah practices, are reasonable and relevant for Noahides as well. On Sukkot, the world is judged for water. The abundance and availability of fresh water, drinking waters, rain, uh, rivers, etc., determined on the holiday of Sukkot. Additionally, this was the holiday upon which offerings and prayers were given on behalf of the 70 nations. Sukkot, therefore, has two meanings for Noahides. It is the day upon which Noahides pray for and acknowledge uh, the importance of water, one of the first creations of six days of creation. It also is the time for atonement for the nations of the world. Connecting to the festivals for the Noahide. Noahides have no obligation to observe any of the Torah's festivals, even those that have universal relevance. And just make this point again. Noahides have no obligation to observe any of the Torah festivals, even those that have universal relevance. Nevertheless, the importance of these festivals for the entire world compels their acknowledgement. As we have mentioned many times in this course, Noahide uh, has not uh, existed as a living faith in over 1,700 years. As a result, any custom and practice of prayers unique to it have long uh, since vanished, and the, the goal of this project is not to attempt to recreate something that is long since lost, but to define the halakha, or what we call the Torah practice. The boundaries for Noahide is the establishment of its perimeters so that we can all grow and flourish. Much of what will be brought here 
are the outlines, suggested customs and prayers for these holidays. The Noahide community will undoubtedly over time develop their own liturgy and customs. It's begun already. Until then, these suggestions may serve as a springboard for you or your community. Let's have this discussion. One day versus two days. Jews outside of Israel observe Torah festivals for two days instead of one day. The exception, however, is Rosh Hashanah. An extra day is added to the holidays by the ancient sages due to the unique diaspora problem. At that time, the new month was declared based on the sighting and reporting of the new moon in Israel. Now, communicating the degree of the new moon or the new month to the diaspora was fought with all kinds of problems. The issue involved often delayed news that took uh, weeks, if not months, to reach the disport settlements. At most, these delays could create a variance of one day in the disport calendar. Therefore, the ancient sages decreed that disport Jews should add an additional day to alleviate the problem with the calendar, if they're in doubt. Nowadays, with our fixed calendar, there is no practical need for a second day. Nevertheless, the Jewish community still keeps this additional day because the original decree that established it was never abolished. It is not known if the ancient Noahide communities observed or acknowledged the Torah festivals in any way. This fact, combined with the lack of con continuity and the transmission of Noahide is laws, etc., and the voluntary nature of Noahide's observance, make it clear that the rabbinic decree of the second day is not relevant to Noahides. Furthermore, by keeping only the biblical ordained date of the holiday, as do the Jews of Israel, Noahides are making a positive distinction as to the unique relationship they have with these holidays. Rosh Hashanah. Let's talk briefly about Rosh Hashanah. Head of the year, Rosh Hashanah. It says that we all pass before him like sheep of the flock, as it is written, he forms their heart as one. He understands all of their deeds on Rosh Hashanah. All pass before him like sheep of the flock. Rashi comments on this Mishnah in Rosh Hashanah 18a. He explains that when a shepherd counts his sheep for ties, he lets them pass one by one through a small opening in the corral. The opening is too small for two sheep to pass at once. This ensures that they can be counted properly as they pass through. It also gives the shepherd a chance to examine each sheep individually. According to this explanation, each person is responsible for his own judgment. It is between him and the shepherd. Furthermore, Rosh Hashanah is a passing through a, a narrow place. It is a day upon which all things hang in balance. However, he forms their heart as one. Beautiful verse. He understands all of their deeds. You see, this verse is surprising because it appears to contradict what we just learned. If Rosh Hashanah is the time of individual judgment, then why does the verse imply that it is a time of communal judgment? Well, the Talmud explains that this verse means that on Rosh Hashanah, God also sees the hearts of all mankind at a single glance. The quick, correct way to read this mission then is that it is teaching us two things. One is that Rosh Hashanah is the time when one must face his creator as an individual, taking sole responsibility for his actions and being. The other is that on Rosh Hashanah, mankind and all of his deeds is viewed as a whole. On Rosh Hashanah, God judges human society and all of its complexity and the vast network of their interpersonal relationships therein. Let's talk about the New Year. Now, we know in many different countries, we celebrate New Year's at a specific time. For most Western countries in January, Asian countries at a different time. Well, in the Jewish calendar, there are several New Year's, but let's take a shot at understanding this. As we have mentioned above, spiritual time is a complicated motion of wills within wills, like a clockwork that one gear affects many gears. The Mishnah tells there are a number of years running concurrently, each 
with their own Rosh Hashanah. There are four Rosh Hashanahs, New Year's. We mentioned these before. I'll say it again. The first of Nisan is the New Year for kings and festivals. That is the 15th of Elul, is the year of the tithing of animals, according to Rabbi Eliezer and Shimon. This is the first of Tishri. The first of Tishri is for counting the years, the Jubilee, the Shemitah cycle, and the tithing of trees and produce. The first of Shvat is the new year for trees, according to the school of, Sh of Shammai. According to the school of Hillel, it's on the 15th of Shvat. Rosh Hashanah of the first of Tishri is the big Rosh Hashanah. It's the, the big kahuna of Rosh Hashanah. This is the Rosh Hashanah that determines how we actually count our years. However, the month of Tishri is not the first month. The first month is actually in the sun. It seems counterintuitive to count years cycling in the middle of the cycle of months. However, it makes sense when you think of the year as a number of years occurring at the same time. The first day of the first month, the month of Nisan, is the Rosh Hashanah for kings and festivals. This year deals with the counting of the reign of kings dating of legal documents and the cycle of festivals, offerings, and the temple. The big Rosh Hashanah, however, is concerned with the spiritual relationship between man and his creator. While months are counted according to the civil calendar, the big picture, years, is determined according to the spiritual cycle. This point is reinforced by a fascinating dispute in the Talmud Rosh Hashanah 10b through 11a. Rabbi Eliezer offers evidence to prove that creation occurred in Tishri, that is, in the seventh month. Now, Rabbi Yehoshua offers evidence that creation happened in the sun in the first month. And then Rab Rabinu Tam points out that they are not actually arguing, they are actually two creations. The first in Tishri was the creation of the world in thought. This was the pure spiritual creation of the world in abstract. The creation of Nisan, however, is the physical creation of the world. The Mases ben Benjamin notes that this explains many differences between the year that begins with Nisan and the year that begins with Tishri. We count years according to the very beginning of the God's thoughts, Tishri. In doing, we assign greater importance to the abstract spiritual creation rather than the physical creation of Nisan. Rosh Hashanah is a day of many meanings, and we're going to cover that in this section. When Rabbi Eliezer tells us that the creation occurred in Tishri, he means that the creation was completed in Tishri on the first day of the month. The creation actually began on the 25th day of Elul, culminating with the creation of Adam and Eve on the sixth day of creation. Rosh Hashanah is more properly the birthday of Adam and the anniversary of the creation of man. However, the joy of this event is dampened by the fact that it is also the anniversary of Adam and Eve's fall. Because Rosh Hashanah commemorates two events of opposing natures, it is holiday full of paradoxical meaning. It is a day of celebration, uh, also judgment and trepidation. It's odd. It is a day of joy, yet a day of sobriety. It is a time to have great mercy, to ask for great mercy, as well as great severity. The preparation, prayers, and customs of Rosh Hashanah all acknowledge this subtle weave of meaning. Rosh Hashanah is ultimately a time of renewal. It is a day when each person must really search his or her deeds in evaluating their relationship both with God and their fellow men. Righting the wrongs, starting anew, asking for forgiveness. Elul, a month of preparation, is a very important month of the Jewish calendar. Preparation for Rosh Hashanah is actually begins a month before the holiday, starting the first of Elul. Since ancient times, the month of Elul has been a time of introspection and review. It was on the first of this month that Moshe ascended to Sinai 
to beseech forgiveness for the Jewish people. It is also during this month that creation began, starting on the first of Elul. Every person should devote daily to consider uh, his relationship with God, his neighbors, his family, etc. A person should uh, assess who he is now and who he wants to be and how he would like to obtain the goals set before him. Our goal in the month of Elul is change. We set out to change who we are, to show God that we can be different, better people, and more accomplished. In English, this process is called repentance. The Hebrew term is teshuva. Teshuva is a technical term. It is colloquial, and used colloquially, the term teshuva is employed to mean any type of repentance. However, the word teshuva is a very specific technical meaning. In the course of your studies, you may come across the statement made by others that says, there is no teshuva for non-Jews, nor is there teshuva for Noahides. I actually heard that myself. When you see this statement, remember that it is dealing with a technical definition of teshuva, which is far more complicated than the way uh, the word is commonly used. The technical definition of teshuva is only relevant to Jews. However, there are other types of repentance. For example, many explain that the type of repentance relative to Noahides is called charata. The details of these technical definitions or distinctions, however, are entirely theoretical and have little to no practical impact on Noahide practice. However, it is important for you to know that when someone says Noahides cannot do tshuva, you need to be prepared to give them a clear answer that technically they are right, but that does not mean they cannot repent and have their sins forgiven. There is certainly repentance for Noahides, regardless of whether the technical term for that repentance is teshuva or charata or anything else. After all, the story of Jonah is all about non-Jews repenting. The custom of Jews, starting on the first day of Elul, is to recite Psalm 27 daily, both in the morning and evening. The Midrash explains that this Psalm, Psalm 27, contains a number of subtle references to the period of repentance and the holidays. It is certainly appropriate for the Noahides to recite this Psalm as part of their preparation for Rosh Hashanah. This twice daily recitation of Psalm 27 continues from the first of Elul all the way through to the 21st of Tishri. Psalm 27 to be recited in the morning and at sunset, daily from the 1st of Elul to the 21st of Tishri. Commentary is found in the footnotes uh, of this lecture. Uh, I'll read what it says here. Of David, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Of whom shall I be afraid? The Lord is my strength of my life. Of whom shall I dread? When evildoers, my tormentors, and opponents draw near to devour my flesh, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army may besiege me, my heart will not fear. Should warfare rise against me, in this alone shall I put my trust. I have asked one thing of the Lord. Only this have I sought, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the pleasantries, the pleasantness of the Lord, and to meditate within his sanctuary. On the day of evil, he will hide me within his shelter. He will conceal me in the innermost shelter of his tent. He will lift me up upon a rock, and now he will raise my head above my foes who surrounded me. I will slaughter in his tent joyous offerings. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Lord, hear my voice when I call. Favor me and answer me. For your sake has my heart spoken to me. Seek his presence, God. I seek your presence. Do not conceal your countenance from me. Do not repel your servant in anger. You have been my help. Do not forsake me. Do not abandon me. O oh God of my salvation, though my father and my mother have abandoned me, the Lord shall gather me in. Teach me your ways, Lord, and on account of my watchful foes who set me upon a straight path. 
do not give me over to their wishes, for they have set against me false witnesses who breathe violence. Had I not believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of life, uh, hope to the Lord, be strong, and he will give you courage and hope to the Lord. Beautiful words. Let's look at the concept of studying for Elul, the period of preparation, works on repentance. There are several beautiful works on repentance, and I will list them here. They're going to be on the PDF. I would encourage you to go to Amazon or to a, uh, a Jewish bookstore and see if you can purchase these books. It's essential for, for your library. In Elul, many uh, prepare by studying the works of Musar, personal developments, or writings about tshuva and repentance. There are, thanks to God, many, many books addresses these topics in the full of very insightful wisdom. Here's one called Returnity by Rav Zwecker. Another book is called The Power of Tshuva by Rav Kleinman. Another one is A Touch of Purity by Rav Sparrow. Here's another one, Tshuva Restoring Life by Rabbi Lecter. And here's another one uh, by S. Falbrand. Another one, 30 Days to Tshuva by Rav Miller. And here's two last ones, Crown Him with Joy uh, by Hadar Margolin and Gates of Repentance by Rabinu Yona. This is not an extensive list. There are many other books out there available. During Elul, many are accustomed to study and use the advice given by Rabinu Yona in his Gates of Repentance in the section called The Foundation of Repentance. We have provided a translation of this text here. The Gate of Repentance states the foundation of repentance by Rav Garona, the Holy One, blessed is he, taught us through his servants, the prophets, and specifically through Ishkel, the uh, prophet, 30 through 31. It says, repent and cause others to repent from all your transgressions that they shall not be a stumbling block of iniquity for you. Cast away your selves all your transgressions and make for yourselves a new heart a new spirit why should you die you who have transgressed and sinned and now comes to seek refuge under the divine wings of hashem and divine presence to enter into the ways of repentance i shall instruct you and enlighten you in the path to travel on that day you shall cast away your sins that you have committed and consider yourself as if you were born today, as if you had neither merited nor fault, a clean slate, a tabula rasa. This day is the beginning of your deeds. Starting today, you shall weigh all your actions in order that your steps are not veered off from the good path. The path will bring you to repentance and completely return, because it is as if you had cast from your shoulders the heaviness of all the transgressions you've ever committed. Thus, your thoughts will neither haunt nor confuse you or, nor prevent you from repenting because of embarrassment from your sin. This is because your thoughts will say to you, how could I be brazen to repent after I have sinned and transgressed, doing such and such over and over? How could I raise my face to a sh I am like a thief who was who has been caught and I'm too embarrassed to stand before him and how can I show myself in his courtyard how how can I even keep his laws do not think like this he states the evil inclination sits like a fly in the chambers of the heart renewing itself every day and watching and waiting to make you stumble he puts these destructive thoughts in your heart Instead, you should remember that this is the nature of the Creator. May He be blessed, that His hand is outstretched to receive the penitent. Therefore, it is good for you to cast off your sins and make for yourself a new heart. And shall you do on the day that you decide to return, when your spirit moves you to become a servant of your Creator, you shall offer up your prayers before Him and say, Please, God, I have sinned and transgressed, and such things I did by listing them out.
from the day I came upon the earth until this very day. And now my heart has moved me and my spirit has pressed me to return to you in truth and with a good and complete heart, with all my heart, soul, and all that is dear to me and to admit and cast away from myself all my sin and to make for myself a new heart, a new spirit and to be meticulous and careful to fear you, O Shem. And you, Lord, my God, who opens his hand uh, with repentance, helping those who come purely to purify themselves, open your hand to receive me with your complete repentance before you. Help me to strengthen myself in fear of you. Help me against the evil inclination who wages war against me with cunning strategies, seeking to entrap my soul and destroy man, that it should not overrule me. Distance it from my limbs, from my 248 limbs, and cast them into the depths of the sea. Thwart it that it shall not stand at my right side to accuse me. Help me that I shall go into your laws. Remove from me this heart of stone and grant me a heart of flesh. Lord, my God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his supplication, and to receive my return to you. Do not let any sin prevent my prayer in return. May there come before your holy throne upright defenders to defend me and bring my prayers to you. And if on my account of my many and great sins there is no one to defend me, then make an opening from under your throne of glory to receive my repentance, that I might and I should not return empty from before you. For only you listen to prayer. You should habituate yourself to always say this prayer over and over. Make it a practice in your life. And such is the path that you should walk and the actions to which you should accustom yourself that you will be on guard at all times to be careful not to sin. In the morning when you wake up from your sleep, you should think in your mind that you'll repent and examine your ways. You should strive Uh, accordance uh, with your abilities not to stray. At mealtimes, before you eat, you should confess your sins. If you strayed in anything, you should confess it. This confession will distance you from all sin and transgression, because if a sin comes your way, you will be cautious of it and say in your heart, how could I do this great thing, this evil thing, and then later confess it? Why should I be one of those in which the Psalms says, in Psalm 78, 36. Nevertheless, they did flatter him with their mouth, and they lied unto him with their tongue, for their heart was not right with them, neither were they steadfast in his covenant. I would be like one who immersed in a mikvah while holding an impure creature. I would be foolish and with little intellect before the Creator for not having been able to stand up to my lust even for a short time like this. And when you put this to heart and your spirit, you will be guarded from sin. You should be swift as a deer, strong as a lion to do the will of your Father in heaven. This applies even to the minor things because all your ways will be measured. And King David said it in Psalm 49, 6. Why should I fear the days of evil when the iniquity of my heels? Interesting, this verse speaks of the sin and mitzvah that men trample with their heels. That is, they've not even been careful about it at all and consider them to be nothing. Sins and positive actions are like dust in the earth. When the time to eat comes and you search yourself and find nothing, then you should thank and praise Hashem, your Creator, who has helped you against these your enemies and that you merited to have one hour of tshuva in this world. Like this, you should then eat your meal afterwards. When the evening meal comes, you should confess beforehand everything, as I've said in the text, and you should do from the time from eating from your evening meal until sleep in the evening. We have therefore three daily opportunities for this confession every day, not just on Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah. Thus should you do every day from the first day of your repentance and afterwards. For one month or one year until you are straightened in fear of the Creator, and have succeeded in abandoning all of your bad habits. That's been this class on repentance and Rosh Hashanah. 
and we'll continue on in the next class in part two.